Hello, I'd like to welcome you to REFCOM 2021. I am Mel Larson from BECT, and I would like to present to you what we see as the role of the FCC now and through 2030. And this will be starting the energy transition. Today, we'd like to talk about setting the stage. What are the energy goals in review? Consider our energy security. Let's look at trade flows. In the US, we are a global supplier, as well as some locations are intakers of material. What do we look at what the FCC is gonna look like and how it will function in the next two decades in the US and then potentially how that affects the rest of the world? We'll look at pad specifics and then I do wanna give a little background on what VEC can provide to the industry. It's really critical to understand the energy transition in and of itself. The energy transition has come about as a result of the pandemic. The pandemic has made clean air in some locations, clean water in Vienna. It's reduced air pollution because we stopped driving, we stopped flying. We've had a challenge that has increased the awareness of if we stop certain activities, that we can do a better job of environmental protection. However, it has come with a price. And that price has been a substantial GDP or global shutdown of most of the world's economies. As we come out of this, there's going to be a renewed effort to dampen down the use of fossil fuel. If you look at the chart on the left, 73% of the energy in the fossil fuel use hangs around the industrial sector, in the transportation sector, and in the energy or the building sector, how we maintain our residents, how we maintain our commercial property. And the interesting point that the focus of this in the refining industry is on the transportation side. This includes road transportation, heavy industry transportation, aviation, as well as shipping. The focus that has been pushed into the green environment has been the utility sector. In the utility sector, we're seeing wind power, solar, a move away from coal to natural gas. And then we're also looking at industrial settings using more uh, reflective glass to uh, or electric covering, coverings, not to use so much energy. But there is more and more a focus on the transportation industry. And that transportation is considering largely electrification. In Europe, they're looking at hydrogen cells. But it's not just within the market of uh, road transportation. We're also looking at shipping and aviation. And the primary focus of the fossil fuels has been a reduction. How do we reduce the amount of CO2 emissions, which has been the primary focus? So utilities are shifting away from coal, even though it is the cheapest commodity. In fact, in the U.S., we've actually exceeded the goals that we had set for CO2 reduction because of our uh, generation of shale and the natural gas, natural gas liquids that have come from that. The next focus is going to be industrial, but in our sector, it's going to be the refinery emissions. How do we reduce emissions in refining and petrochemical processes that are extremely energy intense? And then, as the industry mark, as the transportation industry changes, how do we meet a changing demand in the transportation industry? And one thing to note here, this is not going to be even across the world. What may happen at a pace in Europe, what may be happening at a pace in the US, may not be the same pace of change that we would see in Latin America or in the Asian sector. This is all dependent upon population and population adoption. There are a number of challenges. The biggest one right now before us is, is the reliability. We have recognized that reliability of power, reliability of energy in general, has now become front and center. California had brownouts because they would overload the transmission lines, and yet they still had fires. We had the polar vortex in Texas this year that put a lot of people out of power and actually the result of many people dying. The UK had brownouts because there was insufficient power delivery on a demand basis. So that's a challenge. But then when you look at the chemistry of which we perform, the known works that we do, this very in heat intense, 
a reformer runs it between 970 and 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Ethylene cracking, other industries that are used high temperatures, and we use these two furnace tubes as opposed to any kind of resistive heat that would foul a service. So there's a reality also of supply and demand. Is the supply going to exceed demand? Is demand going to ramp down slow or fast? All of these have yet to be defined in our energy and the transition platform. It's also critical to consider what is the global transition. We are still supplying the globe and the population has shifted and there's also other elements happening around the world that will impact the North American and the Americas market. But in general, the trend is we want less CO2 emissions. At the same time, BP and others have determined that there's going to be as much as 1.5 times increase in the absolute energy demand. Now, that energy demand is going to go across the spectrum. It's not just utility demand. It will also be transportation demand. In the North American market, we don't expect to see much of a change at all. However, we do expect to see GDP growth. The largest growth regions are obviously in the population growth areas, India, China, Middle East, and even in Africa, the population continues to rise. And so there's a much bigger drive for the energy hungry systems and demands. In the US and others, the demand is, is actually kind of flat and slightly declining. And what are we looking at energy sources? Our energy sources have been oil, coal, gas, nuclear. And in fact, I will tell you as we go into the future, nuclear will have to take a larger portion of our utility demand and potentially a source of making hydrogen. And then in the, we have very little biomass and it's increasing. And then the way it's been focused right now is looking at renewables. But in the renewable front, we have to be very careful how we say this. Renewables would be wind power and solar, maybe hydro, geothermal. But in the biomass front, we're talking about rapeseed oil, tallow, or other forms of biomass that would be used to displace a fossil fuel. As we look at the growth and the demand change across the globe, we're looking at significant drivers and how the share of the marketplace is good, looking to move. And so we're, it's going to be a real challenge as we go into the future. The other point of this is if you look at the, the bar graph to the left, there's going to be a substantial change or need to be a change to be able to meet the demand forward with the anticipation that, quote, we won't need it. But the reality is the, the demand will actually stay there while we're shutting down refineries in locations other than the world because they cannot maintain their profit margin. The reason you want to look at all this is consider GDP growth. The chart on the left by Refinitiv highlights global GDP growth as well as US GDP growth. The point I show this is energy is the driver on GDP growth. We have not done it without it. So if we look at there is considered to be something of a steady near 3% GDP growth, to be able to be steady on that GDP growth, you must consider that we're going to have energy to meet the demands of population needs. On the right chart here, it looks at the U.S. unemployment rate. There's the anticipation that we're going to both get back into a developed world and we're going to now be on a, on a low unemployment rate. And on, on low unemployment rate, we're going to have a, a greater intensity in energy. And what you have to consider in the economic element of this, that lockdowns have actually built a, a tremendous amount of pent up demand spending that is not materialized yet. We see populations already beginning to shift because we've learned to work remote. The populations that want to move out of some place like San Francisco and go to, to places like Colorado Springs or someplace in Montana, that's happening and those housing markets are actually booming while the housing markets in the metro areas are actually declining. When you move out into a rural area, fuel demand actually starts to increase a little bit. But if you look at the offsets between one region to the other, you might see that flat. But then again, if we move more into the rural areas, we'll have to see growth in those rural areas and be able to see an increase in the fuel demand. The other element here is our reliance upon the internet. 
we've relied now upon the internet since the beginning of 2020 to be able to continue to do our work. A server farm can, can consume as much energy as 500 megawatts. Now, what does 500 megawatt looks like? 500 megawatts looks like four 150,000 barrel a day complex refineries. I wanna say that again, one server farm, farm can take as much energy as four 150,000 barrel a day complex delayed coking refineries. So we are looking at increasing our energy demand, even at the time period that we believe we need to be as green as possible. So what does that bring? That brings that there's a very strong dilemma associated with the energy system, and that dilemma is energy security. The security is in the Americas regions and in the Atlantic Basin region. We have a good source of crude. It may be dirty, it may not be the best, we have shale, but we have a stable and secure source that is not subject to the political unrest that happens in other parts of the world. The transportation demand has been very steady. There is a lot of uh, discussion on when will we adopt uh, more electrical vehicles. Uh, that's going to be a challenge in the Americas, largely because we have dependence. However, one element that needs to be appreciated is individual ownership of vehicles in the U.S. is actually on a decline. More and more are using Uber, more and more looking at lease options or other options that they actually don't take ownership. The challenge with that is makes it much more difficult to track the demand profile. If you are using Uber and you don't own a vehicle, gasoline is still being used, but it may be more efficient because you're not traveling as much on a whim. At the same time, we're looking at all this petrochemical demand for the things that we like, be it clothing, be it computers, be it cell phones, or be it the, the electrical vehicle that uses aluminum and lithium and other things that are petrochemical based is growing. So again, the dilemma here is we want to be highly energy efficient. We want to shift our shaft work from steam potentially to electrical. We want to use renewable sources of wind solar. At the same time, we want to use less CO2 and less fossil fuels. These are very challenging considering that we're trying to do this on a continued GDP growth without excessive inflation. If we get into excessive inflation, then some of these problems will manifest in a much more uh, challenged way as the population begins to revolt. When we get a look at trade flows, we have to consider that. In the, in the trades, we're largely serving the Atlantic Basin. When we look at the Atlantic Basin, some people that aren't familiar with the industry believe that, well, there's all this refining capacity and it's gonna come online. The reality is Mexico and Argentina and Brazil are not gonna be able to achieve what we've been able to achieve in the US on a regular basis, which is above 85% on stream. And then sometimes we've been above 90 to be able to satisfy the market. The south of the border, be it Mexico, be it Argentina, Colombia, it doesn't matter. Modernization has been a real problem because it requires the, the nations, because these are NOCs, national oil companies, to be able to track the revenue or track the investment to make these. And they've had too many scandals and therefore it's been very difficult to look at. If you also look at these regions, they have a problem with infrastructure. It is not as mature and well-maintained, even though there's an argument of our infrastructure in the U.S. is not the greatest. It is better than the Latin American region. It's also better than everything in, in uh, Africa. Therefore, if you look at this, it's really hard to be able to get the capital funds necessary to make these investments. If you look at the North American market, our, our demand profile is gonna be flat. As we incrementally adopt green, the green, the transportation sector is going to take a while because there are a number of pitfalls that have not yet been worked out in that market. Because we have an absolute easy access to the Americas, and I would include everything from northern Latin America all the way through Canada, we have a ready supply. And when things begin to get tight, we'll be in a very stable position to continue on in our operation. But we shouldn't lose sight that a significant portion of our Gulf Coast capacity actually is exported out of the America's market, but we will continue to supply that market. 
And if you look at that market, this is what we can look at. Prior to the COVID, if you look at these charts, we were increasing. And again, I as stated that there's an uneven profile of how we'll come back out of the COVID environment. The European market is going through its third lockdown. Brazil is having another lockdown. Argentina is having another lockdown. How these lockdowns become uneven have an impact on global trade. And therefore, it has an impact on U.S. refining capacity and demand. We are not isolated. But if you look at the chart on the right, as provided by Refinitiv, you'll notice that we supply a substantial amount of the material into Mexico, into Latin America, and into other regions of the world, Japan, and Europe. Right now, Europe is an oversupply of gasoline and diesel because airline traffic has not rebounded. And so when you consider these uh, profiles, you have to realize that this may be a short-term issue that then gets solved in the very near term and look at 2022, 2023 and beyond of how things will actually, quote, return a bit more to normal because GDP growth is locked down right now and GDP growth is driven by energy. So what does that mean to the FCC? In a fluid catalytic cracking environment, we need to maintain or improve our margin and sustainability. Well, what sustainability means for a cat cracker? The cat cracker has been the central most flexible unit in the refining kit since the World War II. We have taken it from running on sand to running on customized catalyst to all the way now where we're looking at putting bio components in it, such as used vegetable oil, rapeseed oil, and tallow, or even bio crude that may be derived from pyrolysis of plastics, or maybe from HTL, which is hydrothermal liquefaction. The FCC can turn this without a lot of additional pre-processing into valuable fuel components. The challenge at the FCC, it is energy intensive because it burns its own carbon to provide its heat, but that carbon results in CO2. So you have to consider the site energy intensity or the opportunities to maybe rebalance the fuel steam and power balance to make it more site efficient. Is there a mechanism whereby maybe you would change the crude diet and run atmospheric residue as we do today in some cat crackers and shut down the vacuum column as an energy savings? Is there also a mechanism to look at the boiler and consider maybe I can put a boiler on the flue gas side rather than a gener generic steam generator and make it a co-gen kind of a system to improve the efficiency of gene generation and value to the facility. The other challenge here is that it's not one size fits all. That the cat cracker utilization is one that is pad specific. And that is very critical to understand what you may do in the mid-continent, in the Chicago region, or even in the Minneapolis region or other locations will be very different than what you might do in the East Coast or in the Gulf Coast, in the mountain region, and or all the way in California. You have to look at whatever your changes may be in a holistic manner. There may be technology changes, there may be investment criteria, but you have to look at this now a slightly different profile than just looking at gasoline demand. What other changes can you make to reduce your CO2 or carbon emissions footprint and make it sustainable? The challenge here is that there's, this is a multi-year, multi-administration pathway. You can't base it on your current CEO or the current administration as things will change over time, but you must set a path and consider what is the best array for you to go forward with in the unit operation. So if we look at this, we look at product profiles to begin with, and I'll look at this in pad specific basis. If you look at this, one of the things has to be realized, if you didn't know, the EPA changed the amount of the type of gasoline that can be blended into RBOB now. They've eliminated aromatics and olefins as a criteria in VOC in RBOB, which means you can blend 50% aromatics. It's no longer 35. You don't have an olefin limit. You can make it 20, which means you can optimize the FCC endpoint. You can look at the value difference between LCO and gasoline. You can look at the difference between the FCC and the reformer. That changes things dramatically for the market itself. Depending on what pad you're at, you can also look at what it means for the, being the petrochemical market. On the pad differences, you'll notice here on the chart on the right, 
the green bar is pad number one. And pad one is the largest importer, and they get it from everywhere in the world. They get it from the Middle East. We get it from Canada. We get it from Europe. We also get it from uh, all the way from Asia. We actually have alkalite that comes in and from the world. So we, this is one of those things that we, we do in the rest of the world that we, can, we import. In pad two and four, it's a pretty much landmark market. And so gasoline and diesel are on demand. But as those markets become efficient, they can actually move material into pad one if the economics demand. In pad three, we're looking at an export market and, and largely on the incremental material. And it's going out of that region into the, into the Atlantic Basin, as I mentioned. Prior to COVID, we were actually exporting into the European market very heavily because we could do it economically. Our operations are at a higher margin than European theater. In pad five of the West Coast, it's largely a balanced market. And in that balanced market, there isn't, you know, there's very challenged. There's no pipelines, no ready access from the Gulf Coast or the mid-continent into the West Coast market. And there's other restrictions in legislation that limit the ability and the desire to go into the West Coast market because it can be delivered easier from the Asian market and at a cost competitive price. So what does it look like for the FCC in transition? First is we need to reduce the site fuel usage. In general, you would look at all the steam drivers you have in your plant and consider moving as many of those as you can on reliability and safety basis into electric drivers. The second thing, if you don't have a flue gas expander and you have the right pressure profile, we would be to put a flue gas expander on the system, extract the power and continue to generate steam or potentially look at installing a high pressure boiler so that you can actually extract even more energy out of the flue gas. From a production optimization size, you might want to consider uh, that the cat cracker is a hydrogen removal engine and a carbon rejection engine. So you want to be able to look at finding the most valuable feed to input with a high hydrogen balance so that you don't make as much carbon as you used to. So then you want to consider that your carbon rejection in the system, you want to be able to absorb, uh, you know, be able to absorb the CO2 in the system. So the final step would be to consider that you would also want to tailor your catalyst to be able to meet the objectives going forward. In the petrochemical market, we've got to be able to look at there is going to be a continued petrochemical demand in the marketplace. That petrochemical demand is going to be huge and going to be on the increment provider. Capital costs are rising on a tremendous basis. And when a capital cost rises, the incremental provider can be the FCC. And we may change how we run the FCC as a result of this. And how we run the FCC may look quite different from a fuels operation to a petrochemical operation. The question, can we do this in the mid-continent region versus the Gulf Coast region? Pad one is going to continue to be constrained because they are running a sweet crude to be able to make their market. They have not meddled up over years. And therefore, pad one is always going to have a bit of a different risk and they don't have petrochemical complexes near them. From a full transition basis, what does this really mean in wrap up here? One, there's going to be operational shifts. Are they lead or are they lag? And those operational shifts may look at what are we doing over time? Is our demand to be able to maintain the fuel system or is there, are we going to move into petrochemicals? Are we going to change the rate? The point is you can't consider this just next year. You have to now start your plans for the five to 10 year out. Pad one, two, four, and five are going to be pretty centric on op optimizing the hydro hydrogenation and biofuels component. But then I would offer a point of, of caution. Bio is not infinite. The bio markets continue to heat up already in the European theater. And that means when you have a higher demand for your feed, the price rises. There will come a point of price parity where it's no longer advantageous to be able to use the bio component unless there's government uh, subsidy. If the government subsidy is there, that's fine, but eventually that will run out. So you have to be able to consider what changes you can make, what catalyst you need to do, because there are there it is not just simply is running a bio component. There are corrosion components to consider, there's contaminants to consider in the in the uh, bio components that you have to consider what the cost is to process those. In pad three of the U.S. Gulf Coast, you want to look at what optimizing your rate versus the petrochemical production that you can deliver. From a market, market focus standpoint, what's your balance? 
Are you domestically balanced or are you export opportunities? Actually, Pad 1 has export opportunities. And you've got to consider what those ex export opportunities could be and be able to maximize those opportunities and not just look at the U.S. market. The one challenge in, the, in all of these markets is you have to meet the environmental demands that are extremely stringent. They're the most stringent in the world. And so to be able to produce a product with the cleanest possible outflow is the challenge to the U.S. refiner and particularly to the FCC since we are burning our material and we are also have some particulates that may go out. Then you have consideration if you're looking at the petrochemical industry to revisit post-riser cracking so you can re increase your severity against your existing asset. You may look at recycling naphtha, as in FCC naphtha, it's done other places in the world, or consider looking at LSR or other components if you don't need the octane. You might take a little bit of a hit on octane, but you're able to lift some material that is not so valuable into a valuable market. And the other point is being the energy element. How do you heat integrate the facilities in the FCC with the rest of the light ends plant or actually do it so it's cross unit boundaries? Consider looking at a power, a power recovery in your system with incremental firing, make it a cogen plant. Look at replacing low steam drivers with motors or changing the nozzle blocks on those steam generators. Also look at changing the reliability of your plant. Reliability is what's going to drive this thing. The issue here is that you want to be able to consider that you, if you're not running, you're not making money. And right now, the margins are very high. You want to maintain your operations as high as possible. So in the end, I want to let you know that Vect is a service provider. We have 150, uh, 1,500 SMEs that can help you go through your problems. Again, help you not just in the planning forward, but also looking at it from a basis of what is not working today? What can work tomorrow to keep you online, to make greater profit, to improve your efficiency? We have tools. We have plant services. We have people that can do training. And one of the elements here that's really critical, in the last year, the global industry has lost over 400,000 employees, moved on from one location to the other. Some are just out of the industry. Vect has picked up many of those as our advisors. There's been many changes in the service sector. And Beck to spend his time picking up the best of the best. If you have a question, you have a plan, you want to look at planning, you got a hardware problem, you got a crude problem, call Beck. We can help you out. Whether it's on the cat cracker, whether it's on the crude unit, whether it's on the hydro cracker, we're here to make you money so that we continue on this pathway. Thank you very much for your time. And now, after a brief pause, we'll take some pressure. questions. Thank you very much.